We are going to discuss what quantum physicist Erwin Schrödinger has to say about the Upanishads in today's session of this video. The writings of the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, who was a devoted student of the Upanishads, provide Schrödinger with his initial introduction to Indian philosophy, which occurred around the year 1918. A statement made by Schopenhauer states that in the entire world, there is no study that is so beneficial and as elevating as that of the Upanishads. It has been the source of comfort throughout my entire life, and it will continue to be. A description of the link between Brahman and Atman can be found in the Upanishads. The universal self, also known as Brahman, is the ultimate unitary reality, whereas the individual's inner self, also known as the soul, is described as Atman. Tat Tam Asi, which translates to Brahman and Atman are identical, is a fundamental principle that is emphasized throughout the Upanishads. This principle states that there is only one universal self and that we are all one with it. According to the book known as the Aisha Upanishad, Brahman is the source of everything that is living or non-living. All beings are similar to the wise man, and his self is the same as the self of all beings. This is something that the wise man is aware of. This was a concept that captivated Schrodinger's attention. Schrodinger is said to have given his dog the name Atman, and his conference lectures would frequently conclude with the phrase, Atman is equal to Brahman, which he referred to as the second Schrodinger's equation. This information is derived from the book, The Wishing Tree, 2008, written by Subash Kak. When his relationship with the Irish artist Shayla May came to an end, she wrote him a letter in which she made reference to this interest. The letter read, I looked into your eyes and found all life there, that spirit which you said was no longer you or me, but us, one mind, one being. You can love me for the rest of your life, but we are no longer a one entity. We are now two. The gap that previously existed between the observer and the observed is eliminated by quantum physics. There is a statement in the Upanishads that the observer and the observed are the same thing. If the world is actually generated by our act of observation, then there ought to be billions of such worlds, one for each of us, according to Schrodinger's odd line of thought, which he presented in his book titled What is Life, which was published in 1944. What causes your universe and mine to be identical to one another? In the event that something takes place in my reality, does it also take place in your world? How is it that all of these different worlds are able to coordinate with one another? There is plainly only one alternative, he wrote, namely the union of minds or consciousness, which is the answer that he discovered once more in the Upanishads. However, in reality, there is only one mind. Their multiplicity is only present in appearance. In the Upanishads, this is the doctrine that is taught. Brahman is the only entity that exists, as stated in the Upanishads. A distortion of the Brahman that is brought about by our ignorance and faulty senses, all that we see around us is a manifestation of Maya. According to the Chandogya Upanishad, everything there is, is Brahman. Everything is derived from Brahman, everything is returned to Brahman, and Brahman is the source of everything that exists. In reference to this topic, Schrodinger wrote, There is only one thing, and what appears to be a plurality is merely a series of different aspects of this one thing produced by a deception, the Indian Maya. It is possible to create the same illusion in a collection of mirrors, and in the same way, Gauri Shankar and Mount Everest were found to be the same peak when viewed from different valleys. The reasons why Schrodinger would have been interested in such a concept are not hard to understand. It is a fundamental tenet of quantum physics that reality is composed of waves, and that the wave-particle duality is the result of our observations. Due to the fact that we are unable to detect the genuine wave nature of reality, our observation lowers it to the imperfect reality that we see. An example of this reduction is the collapse of the wave function, which is a technical term. There is a direct correlation between the emergence of Maya 
and the collapse of the wave function here. Schrodinger was not merely making oblique references to the Upanishads, rather he had completely digested the fundamental idea to which they were referring. All of these things, according to me, are Maya, in other words, myriads of suns surrounded by possibly inhabited planets, multiplicity of galaxies, and each one with its myriads of suns. Elucidate the process by which consciousness gives rise to reality. On the other hand, consciousness cannot be said to exist within our bodies in the form of a material or an organ. Given this, how is it possible for a consciousness that is not material to engage with and exert control over our material bodies? In what specific ways does the mind interact with the material world? For a very long time, philosophers have been struggling with this dilemma, which is sometimes referred to as the mind-body problem. Due to the fact that we have not been able to locate or explain this interaction, we are left with a choice that seems deceptively straightforward. Either awareness or reality does not exist. Today, the majority of proponents of modern science are inclined to subscribe to the materialist viewpoint, which asserts that consciousness is a consequence of the neurochemical processes that take place in our brains. Without these processes, it is impossible for it to exist. It is dependent on them. On the other hand, the Upanishads adhere to the idealist viewpoint that consciousness is independent of the physical world and that it is the basis for the existence of the physical world. This is because there is no such thing as an objective reality that exists apart from the observer. This viewpoint was backed by Schrodinger, who expressed his regret about the widespread opposition to it, by saying, it must be said that to Western thought, this doctrine has little appeal. In addition to being distasteful, it is said to as fantastic and unscientific. The reason for this is that our science, which is Greek science, is founded on objectivation, which means that it has disconnected itself from an accurate grasp of the subject of cognizance, which is the mind. According to what he wrote, the mind-body dilemma is our failed attempt to locate the point at which the mind exerts its influence on matter or vice versa. To construct the material universe, the self, or the mind, had to be removed from it. This was the only way that the material world could be constructed. Taking it away, the mind is not a component of it. Therefore, it is obvious that it cannot act on it, nor can any of its parts either act on it or be acted on by it. Thank you very much for listening, gentlemen. Please show the video to your close companions. I am grateful to you.